devil tried to throw every roadblock that he could to keep me from getting here, and I can only assume that that means there are some great things that are going to happen from this meeting the night before we, uh, or the day before we left to come here. Uh, my home was broken into, and, and I meant to uh, uh, to tell you one of the thing, many things that were stolen from my home was my laptop computer, which had all of my uh, work from Memphis School of Preaching, all of the sermons that I've written. Luckily, I have all that backed up, but I've got to have something to back that up, too, uh, before I actually it'll do me any good. Uh, but uh, luckily, the night before, I had printed off all those sermons to study, to have a hard copy to study, so... Uh, if that had not been the case, we might have had to put this meeting off because I don't think you'd stand, you'd want to stand here and just look at me for all these meetings. You want me to have something to say, and my memory's not that good to remember six lessons worth of material without any notes. Uh, but luckily, and, and I also have to thank my wife, Christy, she took those. Uh, now, I, I try to conserve papers, so I used eight font, and I had eight font front and back, about ten pages uh, with the entire gospel meeting on it, and Christy typed every bit of that back up for me uh, since that so that I could have it in digital format this morning, or this evening, uh, to present this lesson to you. I thank you for all the encouragement that I received this morning. So many people shook my hand and said, I appreciate what you said, and, and were encouraging to me, and I hope that I encourage others as well. And that's certainly what God had intended for the church. That's one of the things that's right with the church is that we mutually encourage one another. I hate to think what my life would have been like had I not uh, found a congregation uh, in which I could worship and be strengthened and encouraged. And this morning, of course, I, I mentioned Brother Ed Ballard and the effect that he had on my life and Jerry Spellings. And there were others as well, like John and Doug, and who, who taught me how to go out and visit. I hadn't, I hadn't even uh, really, uh, my feet really just hit the ground running, you might say. I hadn't even been here long, and they're telling me you need to come visit me with us. And I, well, I'm like everybody else. I said, I don't have the ability to do that. I can't speak. I'm not eloquent of speech, as Moses said. But they told me, well, you need to do it. So I did, and I thought about those words of Brother Ed Ballard. Uh, just get involved. Do everything they ask you to do. So I done it, and here I am. I'm visiting a lot now these days, and uh, I'm certainly grateful for all the uh, things that I was taught. What's right with the church? Well, we just mentioned one of those things. And up until this point, really all I've done is kind of build this up. And, and we, talked about the, we talked about the question. We looked at what's right. We looked at the word church. And then this morning, we uh, made some effort to make sure that we're in the right church. And tonight, I want to finally get to answering this question a little bit. What's right with church? Five points for us tonight. And we'll discuss each one of them. I'm certain that this is not an all-inclusive list of everything that's right with the church, uh, but this is just a glimpse, uh, some things for us to keep in mind, and uh, as we go throughout the week, uh, Lord willing, we'll present some more things as we go. What's right with the church? Well, first of all, the price is right. I'm going to stop just a minute, make sure you give you time to get Bob Barker or Drew Carey out of your head. The price is right. What I mean by that is, if you think about it, if you've ever worked in production industry like I have, you realize that everything has a cost, and there's many factors that determine the cost that is placed on something. There are production costs, and then within those production costs, there are, uh, you might consider the energy that was expended. You might consider the manpower that's employed, the material costs. Another thing that also, uh, also affects the cost of something is the law of supply and demand. You know, when uh, whether or not something is in demand determines its cost and how much is available determines the cost. I remember a, a few years back, it was a, a one Christmas, uh, I wanted an Xbox 360. And so I went to the store to get one, but the problem was there was a shortage of them. It was Christmas time, everybody wanted one, so the demand was high, but the supply was low, and those things were actually selling on eBay for $1,000 a console. I didn't pay that price for it, I waited. Uh, but that's an example of how supply and demand, how it can drive the cost up. It can also <laughs> decrease. I remember when the iPhone 5 came out, the iPhone 4, you started getting those about $99. Or a two-year contract, you might even get one free. That upset me because it was just about two weeks before that I bought the iPhone 4 and paid the full price for it. So supply and demand has an effect on the price of something. Another thing that affects price is sentimental value. 
You know, sometimes you don't have enough money to buy something. It doesn't matter how bad you want it because of its sentimental value to the one who owns it. You may never get something. So sentimental value is an also, also another thing that figures into price. With these things in mind, what price do you put on the church? What pro how, do you think, how much do you think the church is worth? What price, if we were to put a price tag on it, would we place upon the church? Let's consider some of these things that we just discussed in relation to it. What is the production cost of the church? I want to remind you that the architect of the church was God. And this plan was in the mind of God before the foundations of the earth. I want you to consider the manpower employed uh, in building or creating, bringing this plan into fruition. The entire host of heaven. All the prophets throughout the ages. And then there's this little matter of timing. Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 says, when the fullness of time came, that is, there was this perfect timing issue that's involved, that was involved in the church as well. What about material costs? The sacrifice of the Son of God. Now, are you beginning to see the cost of the, or the price of the church? How much it's worth? Let's consider the law of su supply and demand when it comes to the church. How many churches are there? The Bible says that there is one body. There's one body, and we need to be in that body to be saved. We must be in that body to inherit salvation, 1 Corinthians 15, 24. That body... Christ will hand over to his father one day and, we're, and, he, and we need to be in that body. So we all need it. How does the law of supply and demand uh, pertain to this? Everyone needs it, but there's only one. We can all be in it, but what's it worth? Consider the sentimental value of the church. We know the sentimental value of the church to Christ. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, for his husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That's the sentimental value that Christ attached to the church. He was willing to give his life for it. What's the sentimental, va the sentimental value that God places upon the church? Well, similarly, he was willing to give his son to die on the cross. So he values it very highly. That he would stand, that he would watch his son die that humiliating and torturous death puts a great value on the church. But the question might better be, what is the value of the church to you? How much is it worth to you? What price are you willing to pay for the church? There's a lot of things that a person might be required to give to the church. Sometimes I don't think people count the cost before they become Christians. Uh, sometimes uh, maybe after we become Christians, we some people may decide that the cost is too high and they leave the faith. Are you willing to give yourself as a living sacrifice to the church to see the purpose of the church come to fruition? Are you willing to suffer life and limb to protect the church? You know, in the first century, many people died, many torturous deaths for the church. How many here today are willing to suffer life and limb for the church? Are you willing to sacrifice your pride for the church? Uh, many that would be willing to give life and limb for the church, well, they have a more difficult time when it comes to sacrificing pride for the church. You know, in Romans chapter 14 and 1 Corinthians chapter 8, there's a lengthy discussion there that Paul uh, speaks about these scrupulous issues, issues that aren't really a matter of faith, where, where there's some kind of disagreement over something. Some person says, well, I think the safe approach here is to do this, but it's not really in the Word of God. And so you have these differences of opinion and well, sometimes the best thing to do is sacrifice your pride and not try to lower your beliefs, your scruples, over your breath. Are you willing to pay that cost? Sometimes, uh, or maybe uh, sometimes we might be, need to be willing to sacrifice our liberties for the cause of Christ. In those same two chapters, Romans chapter 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Sometimes a person might be, might should be willing to sacrifice their liberties. That is, do the things that they have the liberty to do in Christ. Maybe the, maybe the Bible doesn't forbid me to do this thing or that thing uh, with a thou shalt not, uh, and, and, and an example or an implication. Uh, however, maybe it might be offensive to someone else in the congregation. Are you willing to pay that price? Are you willing to, to, to pass on something that's your actual liberty to do for the sake of your brother. 
And notice that it says, notice that we're supposed to be willing to sacrifice for a brethren. That doesn't mean that the person who has the issue with it lords over us and forces us to. No, we sacrifice. Are you willing to do those? Things? Those are things that we might be called to sacrifice. Prices that we might be called to pay for the church. Are you willing to suffer uh, estrangement from family who reject the truth? I know that's uh, been, a case, been the case with me, with some of my family. I know that uh, perhaps many of you uh, have suffered estrangement from family members because of the cause of Christ. Whatever price you've had to pay to be a member of the Lord's church, the price is right. Are you willing to pay that price? So what's right with the church? First of all, the price is right. But second, the people are right. The people are right. Now, what I don't mean that Christians are always right about everything. In fact, I know many times that Christians are wrong. They say the wrong things. They do the wrong things. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes it's the case that you can look out in the world and see better morals than you see in the church by some members. That's... That's not the way God wants it to be. But unfortunately, sometimes that is the case. And that's why it's very important for us to understand uh, that the way we view the church is important. We shouldn't be viewing the church as if it's a social club for perfect people, but rather a hospital for sinners. You know, there's a Bible verse uh, I'd like you to think about that really says what I just said, that the Bible says that the church is like a hospital for sinners. Matthew chapter 9, verse 12 Jesus said, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. See, we're here because we're sick. Uh, we, we wouldn't, if, we, if we weren't sick, if we never had sin in our life, we wouldn't need the great physician. But the fact that we're here shows that we do. So we can make that parallel statement. But the people, so I'm not saying that the people are right in the sense that they always do everything right, but they have the right character. You know, I would rather be around my Christian brothers and sisters than anyone else in the world. I've worked with some very fine people. I've known a lot of good folks. I've had a lot of good friends, but I would never place any of them above my Christian brothers and sisters. They mean the world to me, and that's how God intends for it to be. Sometimes we have difficulty with that. Sometimes we, want, sometimes we alienate ourselves from the church because the pull of the world is so strong. That's not the way God designed it. We're supposed to be a family, and we're supposed to cling to one another. And without hesitation, I can say that I love my brothers and sisters in Christ more than anyone else. The reason is that they have God's principles working in their lives. They may not always be perfect. They may sometimes fail me, disappoint me, but I know that they're far better than those people outside the church that don't have those morals because they understand repentance, they understand the, the reading, uh, how to read and apply the Word of God to their lives, meditate on it, and that makes them the right people, the right people that I want to be around. But they're also right in another way. That is, they're right because they're saved. You know, many people make this mistake of supposing that good people, a good, being a good person is all that going to heaven is about. I know many people who are persuaded that and that's really all Jesus Christ come for. He, he just wanted to come to teach us how to live lives, better lives, get along with each other. And if we do that, then we've done everything we need to go to heaven. But this fails to consider several things. It fails to consider that uh, the Bible tells us that I cannot merit my own salvation. I cannot earn salvation. There's none righteous, no, not one. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Jesus, think about this. Jesus would not have come, had to come and die on the cross at all had I been able to earn salvation. The fact that he did come and die is because that I cannot earn or merit my salvation. But some are still under that assumption uh, that they can merit salvation just by living a good life. I don't have to attend church as long as I just, you know, be charitable, give the shirt off my back. I'm a real good fellow then I can go to heaven. <clears throat> if you do not submit your life to the Savior, it doesn't matter how good you like, your life is. Part of the gospel is submission to certainly Christ come and with, to give us a more abundant life. He came to teach us how to interact with one another socially, how to love one another, how to improve our quality of life, how to get to heaven, but He also come to teach us submission. 
and he, we should be like as he was, and that he was willing to submit to the Father, so we should be willing to submit to Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter how good you are, if you fail to submit to God's will in your life through Jesus Christ, uh, then, you, then all that goodness is in vain. But those in the church, they're right. They're right because they have submitted to the Savior. They have separated themselves from the world and into His body, uh, such as we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. And they, and they that gladly received His word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 uh, souls, praising God and having favor with all the people. What's right with the church? The, the plea is right, number three. The plea is right. Now, there are a lot of good pleas in this, in this world, a lot of noble causes that one might uh, take part in. They're called to defend our country. That's a noble effort. That's a great cause. And I know back in, at Zachary, there's several, there's a couple young men uh, that worshiped at our congregation who are now over in Afghanistan or other places and they are defending our country. And that's certainly a noble cause. Certainly we need to be mindful of those people who make such sacrifices for our freedom. And there's other good causes. There's the call to elect God-fearing governing officials. That's a, certainly a good cause, a cause that we need to pay more attention to today. There's a good cause to build better communities that eat healthier, to protect the environment, to feed the hungry, and so on and so forth. There's many organizations that are making efforts toward these causes, but you know what? There's only one organization that God has created to look out for the souls of men, and that's the church. What is the church worth? What's right about the church? It's plea. That's what's right. When the world says that the Bible's old-fashioned, old hat, outdated, and obsolete, we in the church plead, as did Jeremiah, or we should, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask ye for the old paths. Where is the good way and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Jeremiah 6, 16. When the world says, have it your way, Listen to this man. Become part of this group. Uh, align yourself with this preacher. We in the church play. Well, let's just go back to the Bible. When the world maintains this one-sided view of God, that God is love, we in the church, we speak the truth in love and we warn them of God's severity. Romans 11, uh, 11 22. Because, like Paul, we know the terror of the Lord. So therefore we persuade men. We persuade men to obey the gospel. That's the plea. Obey the gospel. Submit your will to God the Father. Because we know, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, that one day Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not, the, know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who are they going to take vengeance on? those that obey not the gospel. Read anything in there about being just needing to be good people, right? If you don't obey the gospel, then this is going to be a dreadful day for you when the Lord returns in flaming fire, taking vengeance upon those that know Him not. For the time will come that judgment must begin in the house of God, and it first begin with us. What shall be the end of them that obey not? the gospel of God. This ought, to, this ought to make every one of us shudder, whether we're in the church or not, because God is going to begin judgment where? In the church. What does that imply? It implies that not everybody in the church is going to be judged as righteous. Not everyone in the church are going to be faithful to the end. And if judgment's going to begin there, well, what's that mean for those that didn't obey? There's certainly no hope for them. What's right with the church? The price is right. The people are right. The plea is right. And number four, the purpose is right. Purpose is right. <clears throat> there are a lot of purposes that the church was not created for. We are not, we were not, the church was not intended to become the most powerful religious organization on earth. You see some denominations out in the world, and that may seem to be their objective. But that was not God's intention for the church. 
The purpose of the church is not to have the nicest building, the most affluential membership, the biggest weekly contribution. And though it may be noble, it's not the purpose of the church to build hospitals, to build orphanages, schools, or parks. Our purpose in the church is to save souls. And that's one of the things that's right to church, to save souls. Evangelism, edification, and benevolence, all the work of the church is for that one purpose, to reach the souls of the lost, to save them. We don't need to forget that charge. Luke chapter 19, verse 10 but that was the reason Christ came. For the Son of Man has come, and seek, has come to seek and save that which is lost. He made this intent clear uh, to, his, to his disciples and his apostles when he gave them the charge to do the same thing <laughs> through, by means of the Great Commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Number five. The, pro the promises are right. The promises are right. <coughs> what promises do we have in the church? Well, this is certainly no all-inclusive list, but these are just a few uh, of the uh, ones that I immediately thought of in the preparation of this lesson. The price, the promises that we have in the church. First of all, John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus came that, to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly. Being in the church, being a Christian, I can have abundant life. Uh, that means that I can have that peace that passes all understanding that Paul talked about. I can be like Paul and learn to be content in whatever situation that I find myself in. But many times I know Christians haven't found that, content that contentment. They haven't found that abundant life. And many times that is because we, we let things distract us. We let things come into our lives and... And, call, and cause us to be diverted from the path that we should be, should be traveling upon. And there's many things in the Bible to help us get back on that path. But we can have abundant life. Christ came that we could have it. The formula for it's in, our, in the Word of God that we all have. Another promise that we have is forgiveness of sin. 1 John chapter 1, uh, verse 9, for, he is, for if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Now that's a promise that should mean something to all of us. That we, are cle that we can be cleansed of all unrighteousness. I know from time to time, even now, uh, I still from time to time fall short of the glory of God. And I'm certainly very thankful uh, that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. And that word cleanseth in the Greek there, it, uh, uh, the Greek formation shows that it's in the perfect tense, which means it cleanses and keeps on cleansing. It's not something that just happens once, but as long as we're walking in the light, He keeps on cleansing us from sin. What else do we have? What other promises? We have God's ear in prayer. The effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. What else? The providence and care, or care, providential care of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Uh, All things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and glory to His appearing. We have a spiritual family to help encourage us and share our burdens. And we have a reward for our faithfulness and eternal destination uh, as a child of God in heaven. Romans chapter 8, 16 through 17. Where can you find greater promises than this? Nowhere. They're all found in the church. They're found in the body of Christ. You must be in the body of Christ to have these promises. What's right with the church? There's a lot of things right with the church. You've got to be in the church to have all these promises is one of the main things. <clears throat> and he hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and 23. <laughs> to be in the church is to be in Christ, <laughs> to be in his body. And notice the benefits to being in Christ. Uh, if you have a, a search engine on your computer where you can search the biblical text for some, some phrase, I challenge you to type in the phrase, in Christ. In Christ. See how many hits you get there. It'll be quite a few. And, and, and try to notice all the things that we have in Christ. In the location, in Christ, we have all these things. To name a few, we are sanctified in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. We are new creatures in Christ. 
1 Corinthians 1-2. Or excuse me, 2 Corinthians. Uh, I've lost that, that passage. Well, it's in the Bible. If you start at Genesis, <laughs> you go to Revelation, I promise you'll find it. We have grace that is in Christ. Salvation is in Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. In fact, all spiritual blessings are in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So the very important question that we should all be asking tonight then is how do I get in Christ? Because I want those blessings. I want those promises. So I want to be in Christ. That's the only place where they're found. How do I get in Christ? Galatians chapter 3 verse 26 and 27 says, For you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> for, as, for as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Putting on Christ is synonymous for being in Christ. Romans chapter 6 verse 3 and 4. Know you not that so many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus. I'm going to read that again. Now, note, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. When does newness of life come? It comes after we arise with Christ. It comes after we've been buried by baptism into the death of Christ. That is where we reach the blood of Jesus Christ when we are buried with Him in baptism. That's how I'm placed in Christ, to that place where all these blessings are found, to where all the promises are found. And that's the pattern we see over and over throughout the Scriptures. On the, first, on the day of Pentecost, the first gospel sermon Peter delivered, Acts chapter 2, verse 28, after those, uh, 38, after those brethren asked, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. And then the text goes on in verse 41 and 47 to tell us, and they were at, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved as they were being baptized. How do I get in Christ? By being baptized into Christ. How do I become a candidate for baptism? We talked about this month, that this morning. You've got to hear, believe, repent, confess, and then you're a candidate for baptism. What's right with the church? The price is right. The people are right. The plea is right. The pr purpose is right. And the promises are right. And, that's certain, and there's certainly a lot more things that are right with the church. I invite you to come back for the rest of our meeting and learn more about what's right with the church. And especially on the, uh, these last three lessons, I really want to take a uh, practical approach and try to uh, really make some applications to our personal lives about how this how this, these lessons can, uh, can change my view of the church and help me to be more effective as a minister of the Lord. Is there someone here this evening that needs to respond to the gospel? We want everyone to have the opportunity. Eternity is far too long for you to, step, for you to uh, go out these doors and, and not have eternity secured. But we want you to be uh, persuaded this evening to make any necessary changes in your life and be prepared. Uh, we've talked about the plan of salvation, the method of entrance into the church, the way to get into Christ, by uh, hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized. And then we also must live faithful unto death. The blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses us, but there's a condition. We must walk in the light. Sometimes we fall short and we quit walking in the light. And when that time comes, we're told to repent. Uh, there's one occasion there in the book in, in Acts chapter 8 where Simon the sorcerer, uh, he had been baptized, and he sinned shortly thereafter, and he was told by the apostles to repent of this wickedness he had done. And so that message goes to us today. Even if you're a Christian, if you've fallen short, you need to repent of your sins and be added back to the church. Is there someone who stands in need this evening? Why don't you come while we stand and sing?